Hey everybody, welcome to episode 123 of Making It. I'm Bob Claggett, here with Jimmy Duresta. Hello everybody, thank you for having me. If you know what I went through to get here on time, you wouldn't believe it. I literally stomped through the rain because I left my microphone outside. It was pouring rain. It's like, like you know when you hear that buzz on the radio and they're like, if you hear this sound, usually it means there's an emergency. In the middle of like a Celine Dion song, that came on, on my local radio. And I was like, oh, this isn't going to be good. And then about an hour later, this major snow, major rainstorm just came through with hail and thunder and everything. And I was about to text you guys that I was going to be late, but I got here just in time. And then y'all were like one minute late, so made me made me early. <laughs> I'm glad you survived. Thank you. We also have David Petrudo. I got some good news for you guys. What's that? I found my keys. <gasps> yes. Shortly after we recorded the podcast. <laughs> they were like, in the beard, right? <laughs> <laughs> you shaved what, I had to shave it off, and it was in the shavings. No, yeah. uh, we were outside, Kelly and I, and Kelly's like, there they are, in the fire pit. They were... Are I, they melted? We haven't... You, no, we haven't used the fire pit in weeks. I don't I have no idea how they got there, but they were <laughs> in the ashes. It rained on them many times throughout the week, and uh, the poop poop worked just fine. Were you nice. there? Like, did you go to it or anything? Like, did you burn a body? Like, what were you doing near the fire pit? <laughs> uh, the fire pit's right out the back door. Um, That's the obvious question. <laughs> yeah, and you know, we don't typically burn bodies right at the back door. The right, neighbors it's too can see from the other yeah. deck. And yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the fire pit's right there. You know, for hanging out at night. Okay. And and uh, yeah, the, our our fire pit is not for bodies. It's for <laughs> entertainment purposes. Okay. <laughs> No, it's so funny. I do that sometimes when I like, I want, like, I'm like, just now I was busy trying to get back here on time and I grabbed my phone and I grabbed my cameras. I was using two cameras at the shop. This, that, the other thing. Oh, my notebook, it's pouring rain out. Everything's getting wet. And then, like, you, not today, but that's an example of, and then I get back to where, and then I'm like holding like a crumpled up cup that was like, I've been holding in my hand for like 20 minutes and it has nothing to do with all the other things I grabbed just because my mind was racing. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? So you like think you need something, yeah. or in that same instance, you would put something down in a, in a harried spot. Yeah. So that's cool. all as well. Right on. Or Weens stole them and then threw them in the fire pit because he's mad at you. <laughs> oh, I'll make it up to you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Cool. And we have Bob Claggett. <laughs> oh yeah, and I'm here. Thanks for having me back, guys. <laughs> Bob, have you been traveling back and forth? I have not. We haven't been traveling uh, since the last trip was a couple weeks ago, I guess. But, you know, since then we've been just kind of preparing. We're not actually taking another trip to move stuff for another month or so. But in between now and then, I'm traveling to Florida. I'm going to California. Yep. I'm trying to somehow get projects done and edited in that meantime. Yeah. You don't have a hard um, out, do you? Uh, no, no. But uh, we're just trying to... Trying to spread it out over the summer. So, like, at the end of this month, we're going to probably pack up the shop and the office and all that stuff and take that in a trip. So then I can start working on the house. And then we'll come back down at the end of July and get the rest of the house and bring it all up. So I'm at a point now where I have more stuff here in the shop to use than I do down in the city. So I'm finding mm -hmm. excuses to stay up here now while the shop sits with, like, several big giant machines still yet to move. Like my saw stop and my last band saw and my uh, chop saw. And then my big cabinet, that's like the main thing that has all the tools in it. So that's that's all still down in yeah, the city. That's still down in the city. Oh. Yeah. I have a hard out the 30th of June, but no one's moving in and they're not going to put a for sale sign, a for rent sign up. So they want to take the space over themselves. So I think they'll be lenient with me if I come in a little bit late. How many more trips do you think you have? About 710. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. I'm glad you've got it nailed down too. No, I probably have like <laughs> 10 more trips maybe. It's wow, eight of ten. Uh, that yeah, like I said, I, it's just. And then I, I get, I do get to leave some of the shelving and the tables and stuff that I won't be needing up here because I'm just going to make everything new. So it's it's starting little, fresh. Mm. Yeah. So that's good. I guess that's one good thing about having a small shop as I do now is that everything has that I have has to fit in that one space. So moving it is going to be a pain because there's a ton of little stuff, but it's not like I have room after room or like 10,000 square feet of shop to move or anything like that. You know what it's like? It's like spreading out spaghetti flat and straight, like on a kitchen table. Like imagine if it was like in a bowl, it's one thing. That's what my new, my old shop was like. And now my new shop is the spaghetti's all straightened out. It's amazing what? how much stuff I have. We were looking. We were Kelly and I were watching the vlog last night, and there's a a shot like you, you run down the entire space, and we're like, 
what? That place is huge, but it's already full. Like, how did all that fit in that tiny little New York? It is. Box? It's funny. I, I was just talking to a friend. I'm like, wow. Like having all these nooks and bends and corners in the old space. I mean, I got four corners now. I have about thirty corners in the other place. So every corner is a place to stick a, a dresser or a cabinet with drawers in it. Here, I have them all lined up on the wall. It looks like I'm having like a, a closeout sale of dressers and drawers because they're all. There's nowhere to put them except side by side. Down in the city, I'd nest one behind here, one goes behind that door, one goes on top. And so it's all spread out. But also what you're looking at is a lot of like one level boxes because we're kind of looking inside every box. So as I bring stuff in, I'm kind of just throwing it on the floor and looking in it just so I could start to put the most important stuff and the most useful stuff up first. And eventually it will all get condensed back together and piled back on top. So I'll be able to get, I'm going to get a ton of floor space back. But that's all just because we're sifting through it. Mm. Yeah. But I know it's, or it'll sit there in a pile. It'll, it'll sit there. Yeah. When I say I'm going to sift through it, I mean I get my whole life to sift through is what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Oh, yeah. I could still park like four cars in there, even with all that stuff that you see kind of busied around. So hmm. that's good. I think. I'm both excited and anxious about setting up a new shop. Like it, the amount of space, I'm going to have five times more space than I have now. That's not an exaggeration, right? No, that's a literal square footage wow. five times. And that's awesome. I mean, I'm super excited about that. But it, then when I start thinking about, like, well, what's the best way to do it? I know that there's no right, wrong way. I can change it anytime I want to. And that's the thing I keep going back to. But, you know, when I think about, like, well, where am I going to put stuff when I get there to start working? And then I just go, well, I could do this and I could do that. Or I could put it over there and over there. But if I do this, then I have to do that. And, blah, blah, you know, just like, ah, so, so many possibilities in that amount of space that I'm not constrained to like well this saw has to go on this wall because that's the only place that it fits well you know what it's like you ever like work on a construction site or you guys have both moved into empty houses so like when you move into an empty house and then you like setting the furniture up in the place where you have the pizza for the first time that becomes like the spot that's always the lunch spot sort of in that room if you end up hanging (laughs) you know like the first pizza when you're like opening up boxes and as i'm moving into this shop i set up a saw to be able to make some other accoutrements to hang things up and as I'm doing that, all of a sudden, those little spaces I establish become the space. So it's like it's like I'm a wasp working on instinct, building like a little mud hut. It just like happens without me even thinking about it. Hmm. And then all of a sudden, then Taylor comes in and goes, well, what's your plan? I go, oh, this is the plan. This is, I had this all in my notebook already. And then, <laughs> mud huts. Yeah. That's my plan. And then she doesn't bother me. So uh, but <laughs> it's, uh, it happens naturally. I, I just, I, I, it, it's... It's probably not the most efficient thing. And like I said, having a big empty space is difficult to fill because I want to keep everything mobile. I don't want to start establishing new walls and new niches and stuff. At least I don't want to do that right away. It reminds me of my recording days. When I used to have a four track, I would record songs all the time. And you have four opportunities to, you know, create different instruments. You could bounce down and turn it into more, but it became a hassle. And then when the computer came along and you had unlimited tracks, I found myself recording less or finishing less because I never, I, I always thought like this, there's more I could add to the song or this track because mm-hmm. it's, uh, there's too many possibilities yeah. and that, that creates problems. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. In that case, like it becomes, well, if you have a four track, it becomes more and more effort to continue to add the further you go. Mm-hmm. And you know that by adding more, you're actually degrading the quality of your original stuff by bouncing it down over and over and over. And that's interesting. There's a trade-off there. And at some point you go, like, the trade-off is the pain is greater than the value. Mm-hmm. But when you have, like, this unlimited space and unlimited tracks, there's no pain. Well, except that maybe filling up your hard drive. But there's no pain in having, like, you know, 300 audio tracks. Yeah. But that's not true. There is pain in that. <laughs> you have to edit them and mix yeah. them and stuff. Well, one day but, you'll have to mix that. Yeah. That's interesting. I never thought about that. I guess I kind of do that too with music. Huh. Interesting. And, and yeah. then the other thing with music is now you have uh, all these software programs. They come with limitless um, effects and things you can do to the tracks. Where back in the day, if you wanted to add a reverb to that track, you you know you had to wire that into the thing and run it through a pedal or, or whatever you had, or or record it the reverb to the track, um, you know, through the amp. And so, but nowadays it's all built into the software, and you can add it post and you there's way too many options and all those options can can you know cause that that mm-hmm. uh what i'm not i can't think of the right phrase but just you get 
stuck in that in that moment where like I don't know what to do now because I have too many things, too many choices. Yeah, you like choice fatigue, like click fatigue, that kind of website. Yeah. Hmm. I have space fatigue right now. <laughs> I just have general fatigue. <laughs> <laughs> I'm exhausted. <laughs> All the time. It's funny, though. I asked my wife if she thought I might have had mono the other day, because I was just like, I'm tired all the time. Like, I don't remember a time in my life when I've just been, like, I wake up tired. I'm tired all day. I go to bed tired, you know. It's just we're doing a lot. So I'm looking forward to actually getting this move. I, I, I'm kind of looking forward to getting it in progress. It feels like we started it, and then it just paused mm. for like a month, you know. So I think I'll probably get some energy back once we actually start making progress again. But... um. I was going to say something. Say. Oh, yeah, with the audio thing. There's a, it's kind of related, but it came to mind when you said that. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I have trouble with with music, some people actually reached out to me about music this week um, on Twitter, and we're saying we're basically cutting down our excuses for not playing music, <laughs> 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 which is fair enough. You know, I appreciate it. Um, but one of the, the things that I've always had trouble with with writing music is that I... I have a progression that I will think a song needs to go in, right? It has a, a big beginning. This is just an example. Big beginning, it drops down a little bit, then it starts to wait, you know, come back up, hits the chorus really big, and it does that a couple of times, and then you end on this, this really big note, you know, so you have the ramps up and down and up and down. And I get into that pattern, and I start writing things in that way, and in that way, the structure is all the same. And so then I'll get tired or realize that I'm not being creative. I'll get tired of that structure. And so I'll kind of like back off of writing music because I get stuck in that thing. Um, I was talking to somebody recently about Radiohead because I've said before they're like my favorite band of all time. <clears throat> and I think the thing, one of the things about them that I enjoy so much and that I respect is that they have restraint in music. And this is something I think, and maybe it's a stretch, but I feel like it can translate to a lot of other stuff is... When I start playing a guitar riff, in my mind, it needs to go big. And it, it may take a while to get there, but it needs to get big and hit hard. And then everybody, ah, yeah, ah, you know, you get that moment. <laughs> Radiohead does this thing most of the time. They don't always do it. Where they will set up that expectation. Like, this thing is going to hit. It's going to be big. It's going to be loud. It's going to be whatever. And they get right up to that point where it's about to hit, and then they back off. And they show the restraint of being able to take you like right to that point, and then they go somewhere else entirely. And I've always really respected that about their music because it's something that I I don't naturally do. Like I want that follow through. I want okay. that you know. Um, but anyway, that's one of the things about them that every time I hear it, I'm like a little bit reinvigorated. Like ah, that's a thing I need to try because it's not something I would naturally do. It's something I need to try with music. Anyway, maybe not related, but. You guys going to get um, together and make a music video? Got to write, <laughs> write a music song first. <laughs> Sidetrack real quick. On the Modern Makers podcast, the, uh, Chris interviewed um, Christina. Um, uh, what's her last name from Port... Uh, uh, get Hands Dirty? Get Hands Dirty, yes. That's um, not her last name. Just yeah. so we're clear on that. <laughs> but, but in the interview, she said something about she reached out to me to collaborate on a music track and I really don't remember this and she says I wasn't rude but I I turned her down and just oh it's because music isn't my focus right now but um Chris, Christina I'm sorry that I that I that I turned it down I turned everybody down I turned my <laughs> wife down my wife plays drums and uh, she's like hey you want to go play music and I'm like mm, nope let's uh let's let's answer some emails you gotta make sure like you gotta make fun. sure she's a subscriber of yours before she can ask a question. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's go poke ourselves in the eyes or answer email. That both of those sound more fun. Yeah. I, one of the cool things about the the new house for us is that um, the down so the basement of the house is going to be where my shop and my office are going to be, and there's another room in front of the office that's kind of facing the outside of the house. That's where the windows are. And it's a big enough room that we could kind of do whatever we want to with it. But it also, we have to take into consideration that it's next to my office, right? So it can't be necessarily a play area for the kids all the time. And so we're trying to figure out like, well, do we put the music stuff out there? Cause then we could set up like a music room, like a, like bigger than my shop and office together now music room and just have everything set up. 
And then I started going down this path of like, well, and then I could put one of those like four by eight windows in my office looking into it. So oh, it's like a control room yeah. and like a student. And then I'm like, ah, oh, yes, I can play music again if it's all set up and I don't have any more excuses not to. So <laughs> that'll be uh, interesting. Maybe that'll happen. I don't know. That doesn't mean I'm going to collaborate with everybody that asks, though. I just want to throw that out there. <laughs> <laughs> put so, down anyway. the email. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what are we going to talk about this week? So... Uh, I, I threw out the question on Twitter yesterday, and Josh Luther, what's up, Josh? Uh, kind of a neighbor of mine. Uh, he, his tweet says, how to say no to people. And then he goes on, it's about building stuff. And I want to generalize that a little bit on just how to say no in general. So let's start with uh, saying no to people that want you to build something. Jimmy told me, 15 minutes ago that he already has an answer. But I just say yes to everybody, then ignore them. That's uh, what I do with my, well, I just gave away my secret. Forget it. I'm going to be quiet. No, I, uh, <laughs> it, it is a tough balance. Every time I do say yes, I really do mean it. But I have a thing with friends and family that I don't charge them anything. And they insist on mm. paying me or they insist, because I can't charge them what I would charge a corporation. And I, I, I remember talking about this year, maybe a year or two ago with you guys that if you charge them all of a sudden then you're indebted so then, then there's that awkward like oh well you know it's not the color I wanted but if you don't charge them and you just give it to them and Take maybe try and get a video out of it that's, that's, the, uh, that's the benefit I try and say yes when I can if it's a little overreaching I'll say you know what I'm not the best person for that you gotta talk to this person who I know is gonna charge them you know a full day rate but I try and find the good in it. So if I do say yes, and I do have every intention of doing it, sometimes they have to wait for me because I insist on not taking money. If I told them how much I really wanted, they would be like, oh, you're out of your mind. I can't believe I'm even friends with you. So I just say, I won't charge you. We'll just do a trade or whatever. And then eventually I do get to it. But I always try and figure if I can make it into a video now because that's my primary focus. My career has shifted to making things on camera. So I'm always trying to figure out how to get a good video. And I even open it up to friends and some family. I was like, you guys need anything for the apartment? Because I have to make something. And right now I can't keep making things and sticking them in the corner. I'd rather give them to somebody. So the last few things yeah. uh, on my, uh, I will want I made for, for core 77. I made that, that big cabinet for my friend, Jessica, that uh, three doored cabinet. The first video I did for on my rather on my rock, my rock channel. Um, so yeah. And sometimes people don't get in in time and I end up just making something for myself. I have a couple of friends there, like designing something. Like, when are you guys going to be done designing this thing? Because I need something to make. And so then I end up making something for myself. Sorry for the long-winded answer, but yeah. So you were, I mean, you were kind of halfway joking at the beginning. Yeah. Of I, saying yes and then ignoring them. Yeah. But you're also kind of halfway not joking about that. Has that ever backfired on you? Uh, Well, I get people say, oh, I guess I'm not going to, I guess I can't wait for you. I guess I'm going to have to go do it myself. And I'm like, you know, I'm sorry. I'm super busy and, you know. I got liquor companies give me tens of thousands of dollars to make stuff. And, you know, you want me to, like, refinish something that you found at the flea market. That if you put a little effort, you could do it yourself. You know, and then you, yeah. you'd have a little bit more of a reward. Oh, I don't even know how to draw a stick figure. Well, this is not drawing a stick figure. It's literally sanding something <laughs> for three hours. So, uh, you know, sometimes I force people to get to get get to the getting on their own, which is always my my standard answer when people say, hey, can you make custom such and such for me? And I realize it's probably not going to be worth the money or I can't really charge a full corporate price. I'll say, you know what? Why don't you try making it yourself? It'll be more rewarding in the long run and you'll be more proud of it. And so people do eventually write me back occasionally and they say, wow, I took your advice. I've never done this before. I can't believe I actually accomplished it. I'm like, there you go. We both, yeah. you know, you got a benefit and I get the benefit of not having to do it. So... So I try, I, you? I try and t tiptoe out of it if I can. Hmm. Yeah. So for me, I think a lot of friends and family get the wrong impression on what I do for a living. And so they think, oh, I'll send you to David because he, ma he makes stuff and he's a, he's a woodworker. And it's probably cheaper than buying it at, at Ikea. And so once in a while, I'll get the emails. And uh, I think... A lot of times I'll just say, you know, it's uh, it doesn't fit in my uh, schedule. I'm sorry, I can't do it. Or sometimes if I do think, hey, that would be a good video, I doubt that they have the money to 
cover it because they, they might not understand the process. But I'll just say, you know, here's my day rate, and this piece is probably going to take me three days. And then we're going to charge uh, materials. If you want to go from there, that gives you a ballpark. And then we can then we can work out a design, you know. And that usually, it, not usually, it always leads to, to nowhere. Hmm. Yeah, I think for me, I mean, it's kind of along the same lines as that. But I think part of being able to dodge some of the stuff that you don't want to do, whether it's friends or family or just whatever, um, is having a really clear... <clears throat> both internally and externally having a really clear idea and motivation and goal for what you're doing and making that really clear, like to yourself so that you know what you should say no to and what you should say yes to, but also outside of yourself so that people know what to expect. Like in that case where people have a different idea of what you do. Um, and so like, I've tried to be really clear with my viewers and with my friends who watch stuff that like, I just make things for me, things that I think are interesting. And like, I'm not, I'm not a production house. I don't really particularly enjoy, you know, making any, any one thing. Like I don't love making furniture more than I love making whatever else, you know, it's not like that. Um, so I think part of, I think it helped in a lot of ways, but when I first got started, I was, I set myself down <laughs> and figured out exactly what I wanted to do and why I was doing it. And that and I've said this a lot of different places, but that gives me a really good way to vet stuff. Like whether this opportunity, whether it's like with a corporation or with a person doing something for them, is this helpful to get to my goal? Not, is it like just beneficial to me? I don't mean it that way, but like, does it work with the plan that I set out for myself and where I want the business to go and the things I want to accomplish and where I want to put my time, you know? Um, and, by having all that stuff kind of defined for myself, it makes it really easy for me to say no to things because I just can honestly say, like, I'm sorry, that just doesn't fit with my life. It doesn't make sense, you know, for me to spend that time making a thing for you that you could buy for 150 bucks. That's that's can't. another way out, too, is a lot of people always say, hey, can you build me? I'd really want one built by you. I'm like, well, if I was going to build you a dining room table, it's $2,000 unpainted. Wow, that's a lot of money. I said, I know it's a lot of money. That's why I'm encouraging you to go buy one from the store because... <laughs> If you want one from me, you know I'm gonna I'm gonna build something within your budget. You're gonna be like, ugh, that's not really what I wanted. I'm gonna build something outside your budget, which is what you expect, and I'm not gonna want to give it to you. So, you know, yeah. I could charge a, a restaurant twenty five, three thousand dollars for a twelve foot table. Like, why would I make it for you and give it to you for nothing? Or you know, the cost of material. That's another thing too. Is when people say, "Can you build me a custom such and such?" I do the fast math. I'm like, "Do you know that six hundred dollars worth of wood at the very, you know, at the very minimum?" What? Why is it so expensive? That, that's just the wood. That's not. That's that's what you have to pay. Made of trees. That's why. <laughs> that's what you have to pay. You know, whatever it is. You know, that's what you yeah. have to pay before I'm going to give it to you for free. Is, if, does that keep us out of the game? Because if that keeps you out of the game, then go to IKEA. Yeah. You know, sometimes you just have to give somebody a reality check, a gentle reality check. Because when you get used to working for corporations, like I always do, they. They they have to like them working for advertising money. Advertising money sometimes seems like an endless pit. They're like, "Oh, is twenty thousand enough?" I'm like, "Yeah, I think it's okay." Well, I'll try and do it. <laughs> I don't know. Let me check with my guy. <laughs> yeah, you know. And then and then someone will come along and go, "Oh, I love that thing you made for Dickel. Can you make me one?" I'm like, "No, <laughs> I'm making you one." <laughs> and that's the problem. They they and they, I know they brought this up on the Modern Maker podcast, but a lot of times we make that one thing and then that's the only time we'll ever make that thing. We'll never make it again. So when oh, somebody yeah. says, "Hey, can you make me one?" I'm like, you know, <laughs> I already made that. I'm moving on to the next thing." Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a tough call. I I always say, "You know what? Go to Craigslist see if you can find it first. Hmm. You know, one thing flat out people all the time in my building for some reason in my neighborhood this like Hey, I got this beautiful dresser. Can you refinish it for me? I'm like, when have you ever seen me refinish something? I said, the hardware store's down the block. They sell paint cans and they sell paint brushes and they sell sandpaper. Three things anybody with a brain can do. I said, I'm not refinishing your thing. I'll pay you. I'll pay you. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there was another question that was, 
I, I don't think it was attached to this, but it goes along with it. And it was something about saying no to charity work. Is that what it was? Yeah. Um, uh, somebody else, I, and I don't remember where the where it came from. It could have been an email or a tweet a while ago. But somebody said, how do you say no to charity work? And we can broaden that to events, too, because you can't say yes to every single thing. Because... Mm. It opens the flood doors, right? If I say yes to this charity, that means I have to say yes to this and this and this. And so I, I, I have to pick and choose which ones have um, meaning to me and, and, and what's going to be more, most beneficial for both parties. Yeah. So I got a funny story. You just reminded me. I haven't thought of this in a while. But years ago, I worked at a, a fancy can, wait, wait, wait. I, I need to. I need to go back one second. I yeah. said most beneficial to both parties, and that sounds pretty. Um, that that sounded wrong. When you're doing charity work, it's it's not mm. it's not about benefiting you. So I'm sorry, Jimmy. Just yeah, no, no, that makes sense. I mean, uh, but it, it also is a matter of where you are in your career. Like if you have if you have substantial money that you need to maybe get tax write offs, and then you say, you know what, I have so much money, why don't I let some other people benefit? And then I get the tax write off, they get the benefit of having the donation, and that's why we give tax deductible donations to people. But as we start out, as we're young people, young companies, whatever it might be, for instance, I I met Tom Felicia, one of the queer eye for the straight guy guys. He was the interior designer guy. He's very funny. We met working on a, at a building together, and he was doing one of the model apartments. And me and my company that I worked for at the time, I was working for a woman. We were doing the other apartment, and Tom Felicia was right next door. I was like, "Oh, you're the guy from TV," and we we started talking, and and uh, we kind of hit it off, like just in a like a casual friendship and he started ha having me do stuff at that particular apartment i did a couple of small things he had a team of like 30 people every time we were in that room there was like 20 people fluffing pillows and hanging posters and putting nails on the wall and so at one point i went to his office and he had it looked like it looked like the new york times newsroom there was like 25 desks of people i'm like all these people are designing apartments for you and he, he's like oh yeah they all work for me and i, I just was amazed and I thought to myself, wow, I can't believe there's that much work in the city. And I, th I think I found out in time that they ended up, he ended up closing that office. He just couldn't sustain it. But somebody from that office shortly after he and I started working together called me and said, hey, we're doing this big, big charity event. And I'm like, uh, okay, what do you want from me? They asked me for like $50,000 worth of work to donate. They're like, we need cabinets built, tables. They were building out like a big thing at some trade show. And it was some kind of benefit. I don't know the benefit. I don't know anything. And I'm like, wait a minute. You want me to do all these things f f on my own dime? Like, it's literally doing all the physical work in this, like, apartment that he was going to set. And they're like, well, yeah, it's, it's going to be in the New York Times. It's gonna, you can't pay for this type of exposure. I was like, well, I can't pay for even now that material. I, not much of <laughs> my time. And I just, I absolutely, I said flat out, no. I said, thank you for the opportunity. I try to make it like a, a nice face. I said, but no. But I went away thinking. I wonder if people actually do say yes to these type of... Like, he's donating his time, but he's just standing there pointing at things and saying, make that red. And someone like me, who has to actually go and get the material, make it red, get the paintbrush, get the drop cloth. You know what I'm saying? So his time was really just more like in, in thin air. My time would have been all physical. So I said flat out no. And I, I just... I was really taken back that somebody would like expect that much of me, just some little, this is in 2009. So this was eight years ago of me to be able to do all this stuff. They're like, well, it's really going to, uh, uh, in style magazine is going to cover it. They mentioned all these things. I'm like, it's, that's no big deal to me. I, I still need someone to pay yeah. me to do something. And I, right now, you know, if you're a little small guy and you have some success, you know, you're going from one job to another and you have just the amount I had, I've always had just the amount of work I could handle. When you start getting too much work that you can handle alone with one assistant, it starts getting overwhelming. And it's great to say, you know what, I have so much work. I, but I didn't even need that exposure is, what I'm, is the point I'm making. Mm. Anyway, so there are people that ask for guys like me and you guys to like do this stuff for free. And I just, I just can't afford it. I want to help. I, wanna, you know, I don't know yeah. how my work was going to be <clears throat> charitable. Maybe they were going to raffle the things off that I would have so-called donated. But yeah, so I, I couldn't do that. Yeah, I mean, again, I think that's one of those things with charity work in general is that if you kind of know yourself and you know the things that you care about, you leave enough uh, margin in your time to invest that time into the things that you want to invest in, the things that you care about. You know, like if I were, if my kid's school asked me to do something for the school, of course I would do that. Yeah. Because I care about 
their education. I care about the people who are spending their lives educating my kids. But like if some random foundation came and said, Hey, we want, you know, the thing that they just did for you, uh, the thing they asked you to do. No, there's, I'd leave no room in my life for that kind of giveaway. Um, yeah. But that's because I know what I care about. No, I, I mean, I, I love giving about. tools away to people in need, you know, some fans, some friends that need tools. If I have an extra thing here, come take it and pick it up. I've already given some of my stuff in my shop away to some local fans that are in need of certain tools. Or like, hey, I never even knew I needed one of those. Oh, well, here, take this and try it. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, wow, <laughs> I never knew I needed this. Now I can't live without it, whatever it might be. Or materials or, uh, you know, and a lot, I've been given a lot of stuff over the years by the TV companies and so I give it away it's like no reason for me to even sell it and even now I still get a lot of freebies from you know ad placements and then if I have more than a couple I give them to a local friend so that's the charity that I like to give is directly to give Mm. to somebody and help out you know the fans and the friends that are close by if God willing I ever become a millionaire and I have disposable income that I could just need to give away for tax purposes I would certainly give it to maker spaces or you know places to encourage learning. Or me, <coughs> <coughs> or you guys. Well, what about? I'd make you a key rack. <laughs> I'd make you a key rack. A, f- a few times, especially when I was doing the the weekly wrap up uh, every week, uh, I would get the emails of like, "Hey, we're running this charity. Can you just mention it on your show mm. or after your, your video?" and you want to, but then that that can open up the floodgates because you don't want to just have everybody send you these things to to promote. Have you have you had to deal with this? And does it make you feel guilty when you have to say no? And how do you say no? It does. Um, I have I get that a lot, but I also set up front like there's no reason for me to do shout outs for people. There's no reason for me to do. You know, just like I'm going to break the content that I'm creating in in a way to just like promote this thing that I'm not attached to. Like I would break a video to talk about this podcast because it's something I'm invested in and something that has an effect on me. Um, And I think there are other ways to be helpful to outside things that you're not attached to. So like if a charity came to me and said, you know, can you promote this or one of your videos? I would say, no, I'm sorry. That's not something I've ever done for anyone It's just not the flow of my content. Is there another way I can help? Is there like, you know, do you have like a targeted thing somewhere that I could like show up to and like leave a comment and draw people to, or I don't know. I don't know how I could be valuable in there, but instead of like trying to force something that doesn't fit into my content or into my business, I'll say, this is just not something I do. How else can I help? And usually people go, Oh, well that's, that's really all we wanted. (laughs) Hmm. <laughs> and then you're like, oh, thanks. But, hmm. um, but for me, it's just by, again, I'm going back to the same thing, by setting a standard for myself and by predefining like what I will and will not do ahead of time, it makes it a little easier for me to, to say no to that type of stuff. Um, and that, you know, that doesn't mean that like sometimes if something's cool and somebody sends it to me, I'll tweet about it. That takes basically no effort, but I can't do that for everybody. You're right. I mean, you can't, you got to draw the line somewhere. Yeah, you know, it's it's really just timing too, how you feel. Like when like I did the knife thing a couple weeks ago where I made the thing for, for browse blades. We just traded. He gave me those knives, I gave him those hands, you know. And then he got the exposure on my channel. It was just I didn't care because he's another maker who started out like us just making things on his own in a CNC machine. So it's uh it's all just timing too. If it's right, it's right. Sometimes it takes a little bit too much effort and it just doesn't work out. It it yeah. it, it really is timing because I'll get somebody that uh, the, the, the copy me uh, in, a, in a tweet and saying, hey, look, I just made this inspired by your thing. And if I just tweeted out something a second ago, you know, like I probably won't retweet that. But if I haven't tweeted anything all day and somebody sends me this thing that uh, that they made that was inspired by me, I'm retweeting it right away. I'm like, oh, great. And so mm. it's one of those weird things like timing is is everything. Yeah, uh, that's interesting. Uh-huh. So along this um the same idea like we're talking about charity but let's jump to business stuff a little bit because this has come up so much and i heard people talking about this at maker fair this year um where these companies like buzzfeed and there's like a million of them on facebook now where they create short versions of your videos or whatever content you have and i get these emails at least two or three times a week from some company that says like Hey, hey, can we have your video? We're not going to like monetize it. We just want to cut it down to our own version, put it on our Facebook page, and then we'll like put your link in the description and you'll get some exposure. Now, I know some people like that do that and they they say it's good for their business. So, okay, maybe it is. But I want to point out that 
in those situations, when somebody comes to you and asks for you, asks you to give them your work without compensation, and they promise like exposure, you may get exposure, you may get a million views, but who knows who those million people are? And so you could be getting, you know, if you make axes, those million people could be stay-at-home moms who are looking for recipes. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> what good does that do anybody? And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm joking, but I'm also not joking. It's because yeah. uh, yeah. they don't, even if they do target what they're using your content for, you don't get to choose. And you don't know how it's being used. You don't know who's seeing it. And there's no way for you to measure the return. Mm -hmm. Well, that's probably not true. There's not a great way to measure the return. Yeah. I say so, no. They ask me all the time. They're like, hey, can we use such and such video and cut it down? And da, da, da. I say, no, absolutely not. I was like, you can use my YouTube link, but you cannot cut it down. Yeah. Oh, but you'll get all this exposure. I say, I have a, you know, a million subscribers. I, could, I have a lot of exposure. I don't know who you are. I don't know. Lately, yeah. some people I've gotten, the last couple I've gotten, don't give me the link to their Facebook page. They don't want me to see what they do. I'm like, I don't understand this. <laughs> It's just like almost sure. like they just that's just a fishing expedition. So they'll say, "Hey, we got this great Facebook page. You'll get tons of exposure if we just cut down video, you know, such and such." They'll say the title of the video. And I'll say, "Absolutely no. Absolutely no way. If you want to use the YouTube link like anybody can fairly do, I said you can, but do not repost yeah. it." A lot of times I will make short um 45 to 60 second versions for Facebook and in the past, I've just said, "Hey, you can, you know, you can use my Facebook link, and mm. but it it must be attached to my Facebook page." But yeah, I, mm. I won't I won't give my videos out. Um, I've even had people offer to pay for videos, and it was a ridiculously low amount. But I won't. Yeah. I will, like Jimmy and and you, I will never allow anybody to use my videos outside of my control. Yeah. And I mean, there is like, I've had a few of those come to me and say, you know, we want to use your stuff for free and put it on the whatever. And my response is always like, well, I don't, you know, work really hard on my videos. I'm happy to license them to you if you want a, a limited license. And usually that Gets rid of turns into no response at all. But <laughs> I have had a couple of people I've who have responded and say, they said, great, how much? And then I'm like, oh, uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and so then I have to figure that out and, you know, come up with something. And, and they've never panned out because... Yeah, it's too I don't have any clue what that number would be, and I don't think they really do either. But anyway, the point of all that is I'm just saying it's so easy, like with an opportunity from a friend of yours who wants you to build a thing to put on YouTube, it's easy to look at every single opportunity as like, oh, this is going to be the one, or this is going to be really helpful, or this is going to be really whatever, and that's just not always the case. And it's there's no formula for figuring out which ones are good and which ones are not, but um, I don't know. I think... I think there is opportunity out there, but I think you have to be more choosy than not. You know, I think the ones that are worthwhile are far fewer than the ones that will be thrown at you. Yep. So, yep. As far as like tweets, emails, and comments, what's the one thing people ask you to do? Make fidget spinners. <laughs> <laughs> Make fidget spinners. <laughs> that you that don't want to do. Yeah. Dear world, no. Yeah. Okay, no, I've said it. <laughs> Yeah, Bob will not do Sorry, a fidget spinner. Um, so I, I mean, I get asked a fair amount of times, like, "Hey, you should make this, or you should remake that project, but use limited tools to, you know, so it yeah. benefits the the people who don't have all the tools." Do you respond to that? Do you ignore it, or do you have you found a good way to say no? I have an answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I don't respond to all of those. I get that same thing a lot. Like, can you make projects with just hand tools? Or can you make something with, like, basic, you know, stuff that everybody has? And when I do respond, my response is <clears throat> what you have, what you think of as limited tools is not the same as what a person in a third world country thinks is what is limited tools. So if I lower my thing, what I'm doing, to match what you have, then I'm alienating somebody else who has even less. And so it doesn't make sense for me to try to build at the lowest common denominator because there is always someone else who doesn't have. And if that's your goal, then like, I'm not saying you can't do it or anything, but for me, it's just not, it, I don't, there's no value there. There's no like, and the purpose of my builds, and I say this in a shorter winded way online, is not to like show you, to get you to build a lightsaber. That's not the point. The point is 
I wanted a lightsaber and I built a lightsaber. What do you want? Mm. You know, that's like what I, you know, you want a doghouse? Awesome. I don't need a doghouse, but you should totally make yourself one. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. Um, so that's my response because you can't always go down in, you know, the tools that you use. There's a point where like, well, so what am I just going to use the tree in my hands because that's what we all have access to. So teeth, you use your teeth, (laughs) teeth, (laughs) teeth and fingernails. (laughs) Yeah, I, you know, my response to that is always, you know, like, uh, let's see you walk to work tomorrow. Can you? But you can't go to work tomorrow without electric. Oh, you can. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, if you walk twenty miles to work, I will build this thing with no electric. <laughs> I said it before. I say it again. I don't know why people draw the distinction of electric is bad in the workshop, and every single modern convenience has been benefited from mm. stored power. If for some reason in the workshop hatchets and hand hewns and froze and chisels are supposed to be immune to the upgrade. See, that's interesting. I've heard a lot of people talk about hand tools, but I've never heard the anti-electric argument, which I totally like the hand tool, full hand tool thing is not my thing, but I get it. I understand why people like, enjoy like Chris chops does, does, does everything, but Chris does it because he wants the exercise. He says it straight up. He goes, he said he, hmm. he got a little bit older in age and his kids went to college and he goes, I just wanted to figure out how to keep busy and keep exercise. So he goes, let me make things with hand tools. And, but he's not a purist in the way that like, you know, certain YouTubers will only use hand tools and to turn on a table. So it would be blasphemy, which is you know silly to me. But not silly to them. I mean, everybody has their own way of doing, doing no, things. No, it's, and... it's silly for them, too. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I'm only saying that because I get I catch a little shade from them, from those people from time to time. Uh... Not me personally, but any... Like, it's like when you when you hang around two people that only use hand tools, you know, they're like sipping tea with their pinky in the air going, oh, you have a saw? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for you. <laughs> you guys have known that vibe. You've seen that vibe. Yeah, and then yeah, yeah, yes. So, Do we cool. Wanna... Well, we got any other? Um, well, here's, any other questions from Twitter? Here's another one that goes back to how we started off the the podcast. And Brian on Twitter, Brian Hernley asks, "What are the pros and cons about moving to a new place or state?" Goodness. Yeah. So, can I can I start off? Please. The biggest pro for me is I get to start from a clean slate. I get um I, I'm I have this big empty room and it's perfectly square or rectangular that there's no there's no obstruction. There's not a staircase, there's not a water heater, any furnace in the middle of this new shop. And I get to do whatever I want to this place to make it mine. Where I didn't quite have that here, so I am super excited about making the new place the dream shop for me. That's the pro. The con, I think, is all the the obvious things, which is the the, the physical uh, moving, the time it's going to take away from the business, the um, the uh, not knowing where everything should be at first, because you kind of have to get things in place and use it for a little bit. Um, see where Jimmy puts down that pizza, where we're going to eat, you know? And, That's right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and so I, I, I got a feeling that the, the first layout is not going to be the final layout. That's true. I, I, oh, yeah. I'm making my, my shop a little bit flexible. I will have some shelves along the walls and some counters along the walls, but all those countertops, I used to build them in place in the last, I must have had five shops in my life. I would always build those counters along the wall in place. Now I'm going to make everything mobile. In the event, that I leave this space again because it's not mine to own, but also in case I have a big, I want a big uh, build a sound stage. I want to be able to shift everything out of the way so I could build a sound stage for a shoot or something. I just want mm-hmm. to keep the shop flexible. So there's a couple of heavy, heavy tools which probably won't be that easy to move, but they're not bolted to the ground. You know, my big old planer and some stuff. But I'm gonna kind of keep it in a in a mindset that everything is flexible. So. Like it. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think. I probably have a very similar thought on what you said, David. I mean, I, I think having the flexibility and having the more space to like lay it out from scratch. Cause I, I guess my shop kind of happened the same way where like, it wasn't really supposed to be a shop, but I had tools that I was dragging outside. And then eventually I put a wall up and just kind of like worked with what I had there. You know, I already had cabinets on one wall. So it was like, well, the saw has to go on the other wall. And so, yeah, just being able to start from scratch. Um, 
<clears throat> and I mean, for me, I'm moving into my grandparents' house. And so there's a huge plus there just from like, I'm not, I know it's just a house, but I'm also really excited about creating stuff in a place that my granddad created stuff because I, he did so much and I learned so much from him. So that's really cool. Um, I think the big thing for the shop for me that I'm looking the most forward to is having like a separation of concerns, like to where I can take the metal stuff and put it in a corner and I can take the wood stuff and put it in a big section and I can take the 3d printers and put them in a separate room, you know, and I can, I can just spread things out and have them separated, not like fully separated into different rooms, but at least like, no, if I want to do something, I can turn and point that direction and go do all of that stuff over in that one place, you know, mm -hmm. that's pretty big. Um, as far as the, just the move though, uh, I mean, this sounds kind of whatever, but making friends in a new state Oh yeah. as an adult, mm -hmm. that's a little bit scary. I mean, I have friends there, my family's there, so it's not like we're going to go somewhere where we don't know anybody, but at the same time, like, you know, as an adult, you get into patterns, you work, and we have kids, so we spend a lot of times, time with them and doing things. Like, I don't know when to go out and make friends. How do you find new friends? How do you, you know, that type of thing. So Go to the playground. There's a little bit of, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, we'll probably go end up meeting other parents who we're, like, in the same life phase with and stuff. But it's just one of those things you don't really think about as an, an adult until you get in the position. Like, how do I make friends as an adult? I'm not in school anymore. I don't work in an office. It's not like I can like meet people at the office. Um, and how does my wife do that? Whereas I can put my head down and work a lot and be perfectly fine. You know, she's not necessarily that same way. So there's a big concern in that. Um, I think the kids will get integrated fine. You know, the kids meet friends easily and all that stuff. I'm not really worried about that, but just the uh, the exhaustion of packing everything in multiple trips and putting it in a truck and driving. It takes two days to get there. You know, it's like an overnight hmm. trip in between, and that's just exhausting. And yeah. then getting there and dumping it, and then, like, we had to turn around and leave this last time, and we'll have to do that again before we actually get to go there and stay. So in between now and then, we're not unpacking. It's not like we're taking a little bit, putting it where it needs to go. It's like we walk in, dump the boxes, turn around and walk out <laughs> and then leave for a month and then come back and do the same thing again. So, you know, that's kind of a little frustrating just because there's like there's no there's no second half yet. It's the first half of just packing and yeah. it's still packed. So I have I have something. I'm really excited about it, though. What's up? I have something to ask both of you. Um, one of the things I'm excited about in the new place is I want to make it very camera friendly. And one of the, the one of the biggest concerns is I want it to be visually pleasing when I walk into my my shop. We've talked about that before, um, but while I do that, I'm going to make it very camera friendly as far as like lights and sound. And I want to know if you guys are doing any kind of planning with your new spaces with light and sound, or is that going to be kind of an afterthought after you move in? I'm not going to do anything before I move in just because I don't have time to get in there and like do that work before I move tools there. But it's definitely one of the first things that will be happening. The good thing is my space is big enough that I can move everything in to the center and not necessarily put anything against walls while I build it out, you know, so I've got some room. But um, I definitely want to put up some sort of wall treatment all the way around just so it doesn't look like concrete block and, you know, so I can hang some stuff. I want to eventually um, soundproof at least portions of the ceiling because our main floor of our house is right above that. So kids running through there, you can hear it. Saws, you can hear up in the living room. And then lighting is actually a bigger unknown for me. And maybe you guys have some insight on this. Um, so in a typical workshop, a non-filming workshop, you want a lot of light overhead so that everything is flooded from above, right? But when you're shooting and you, and that's, your only light source when you're shooting, that's bad because then anytime you lean over something, you're creating a, a really heavy shadow. So I thought, well, and like currently now I have lights, side lights that I can clip onto things to fill from the side so that you don't have as much like contrast in the shadows. In a big space like that, it seems like, well, okay, on the walls, I'll put some shop lights, some big giant shop lights to fill across the shop from both sides. But then 
if you point the camera at those lights, then it's like you're looking at the sun. So mm-hmm. do you have any ideas there on like how to do a more general fill kind of ambient light? Well, what's, what's worked for me in my big giant space are these big giant balloon lights. I got these china balls, which are just paper china balls, and I put in the these big LEDs, which I keep promising people I'll talk about. I don't even know what they're called. The fan sent me a link on Amazon there, just like a big tremendous LED bulb that has 4,000 lumens, I think. And it takes the bigger base. It looks like an Edison base, which is your typical light bulb, but it's supersized. It's like a factory light bulb size, but it looks the same, but bigger. And I put that on the China ball and the light in there is great. I mean, the, the, the light temperature is about four, four, I think it's 4,000 Kelvin. It's, you know, right in between incandescent and, but when I put it on auto, every, the white balance looks really good. So you'll see some of my upcoming videos, and I have two of them, and I ultimately I'm going to put try and put six of them in there. And they're low energy, you know, the low energy consumption bulbs, and they don't get over hot. It has like a little fan in it because there's a computer chip in the bulb itself. Mm. And yeah, that's pretty cool. I got to send you guys a link right now while we're talking, but it yeah. I'll find in my Amazon history. But it it's a great, great, great light source, and. It's up above, so I can still shoot. Like when, when I shoot in my shop, unless I'm doing a big wide, there will be sort of an imaginary ceiling. I'm not going to try and shoot above the lights themselves. Mm. So the lights are at about eight or nine feet high. So they it creates like a nice cast in every direction. So that's what you need. You basically need like a, an area light. That's what it's called, an area light that kind of just fills the whole room with light. And it gives a nice nice soft light. I wonder how I can do that without having a bunch of overhead space. Yeah. Well, if you put one in the corner, obviously you could shoot it out of a corner or, you know, in a couple of key spots just off camera. You know, you got to designate a few spots in the shop that are probably never really going to get pointed at. Hmm. That's why I never liked the 360 camera because there are certain spots in my shop I never wanted people to see. Just because it's just a big giant pile of mess. So that is not going to show up on, on camera here, but I have these LED... Um, Star Wars lights. Uh, uh, I'm not. I don't. I don't even know what they called. What they're called, but they, I got them from Amazon. And the great thing about these is they can be used uh, individually, or they can be strung together. And and so that you know you can get a bunch of them to only use one one outlet. And I have them just taped up or uh, kind of wedged in between floor joists in my in my basement, and they've worked really well for the past couple months since I've had them. Hmm. I'm not sure what I don't know if those are going to move to the new shop. I have because I have um I'm starting from scratch, so I'm gonna look for the, the best possible thing. But I'm very curious about these these um area lights that Jimmy has. I just sent them both hmm. to you guys through the text message. I guess we could read the name of them on camera here. Might as well. Yeah it's uh I guess we could put a link in it too. And a fan sent it to me. They're called Rugged Grade 100 Watt E39 LED Bulbs. They're actually 11,500 lumens at 400K, so I remembered it incorrectly. Uh, HD, HPS, Metal, Halide, CLF, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. Lumen Watt, 36 degree lighting, 36 LED corn light bulb. The hmm. best Corn bulb. Nobody builds a better corn bulb. Blah 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 blah. Five year warranty. Corn bulb. Corn looks like corn on the cob. It does. Huh. Yeah. And, and so, it, can I ask a question? One hundred and fourteen dollars. Uh, the uh, the globe around it is that is that um, something paper. else you bought on it? Paper. Twenty dollar china light paper paper bulb. Uh, I got it at a lamp store light. in my neighborhood, but they also had them on. They have them on Amazon, but they only have them at twenty four inches. The ones I bought at a store in New York City at the Just Lighting place I go to. They're 32 inches, so they're much bigger. And the bigger the the bulb itself is, like, you probably get a little bit more of a even disbursement of light. Oh, cool. Yeah, that that paper diffuses it nicely, I would imagine. Yeah, it's hard to get like the vibe of it in the shop when I shoot right at the lights. They just kind of everything's everything's on auto exposure, so it just closes down, and the lights look like little moons in the sky. But they actually do put off a nice even tone of light if you're in there cool. underneath them. Hmm. Yeah. So. We'll put a link to that. It's just it's on Amazon. Cool. Any other thoughts on moving or shops or stuff? I'm, I'm sure I will in the future. Yeah, I, I welcome. I'm, I'm real happy. I'm really happy that I'm moving, and it's such a for me. It's it's real natural. Everybody keeps asking me, "Are you going to be nostalgic for the shop?" 
like I think imagine like when you see a dog in one of those cages or like when you see a prisoner in his cell and he has all his personal stuff hanging on the wall <laughs> and then he gets to be out of that but he has to leave all his personal stuff or put it in a box do you think he's nostalgic for that cell <laughs> Well said. <laughs> My, you know, when you see a dog in a cage and you think, does he get nostalgic when he's allowed to go run around in a big backyard? <laughs> <laughs> it, I'm telling you, the shop was great. Well, it served the purpose it did. It got me. It was a jam. It was, it was a... I ended up there because I was having a financial crisis and I ended up renting that space. I, I started the rent at $400 a month and now it's just under 2000 a month, 14 oh years later. But uh, it it served its purpose. I mean, uh, you know, and I I, born, I I birthed my channel out of there, and it was great. It's a, it's a great little odd, weird piece of New York, but it served its purpose, and now now I'm moving on. Yeah, I, I told my kids they were asking, um, they were asking about moving, and they were like, you know, bummed that they were going to be leaving the house that they all grew up in, and because my oldest was nine months old when we moved into this house, so the other three have been born here. And not here, but you know what I mean. And so they were asking about like, well, isn't it going to be sad that we're leaving this house that we're all so used to? And I told them that when we moved from our last house into this one, it was the first one we had bought together, my wife and I, and we loved it. And it was a cool little house. We had our first kid there. It was really important. We did a bunch of work to the house. And when we bought this one, I remember thinking like, I don't know if I'm ever going to like you know, if I'll enjoy the new house as much as I do this first one. And a week after we were in this new house, I was like, man, I, I'm so glad we we're here. This place is awesome. Like, I love it. And I, I still like that first house we had, but it was like just what you're saying. It was a point in time. It served its purpose as our first home. It taught us a lot. And then we just immediately fell in love with this one. And I think that'll probably happen again, as long as you're moving up to something that you want, you know, shop or, or house or whatever, car. Um, you know, I think it gets better and I think you probably don't really miss the old one so much, but I mean, you won't have rats, right? <laughs> no, you know what I have this time? <laughs> I have like an uncontrollable amount of birds flying around. I'll be in the middle oh. of the and there's like a bird flying two feet above my head, trying to find a place to land. There's always like three or four birds in there. It's pretty, pretty nuts. Hmm. Yeah. You need a pet hawk. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> Cool. Well, um, you guys been watching anything? Yes. I just I just discovered this new channel. It's called Brand Made TV, and it's it's a channel of how things are made. And I think everybody who listens to this podcast is going to love this channel. They have videos on there of how a Veritas rabbit plane is made, Ooh. how the Herman Miller uh, Eames lounge chair is made, how a globe is made. They're really well done. They're, um, you know, like short, uh, some are five-minute videos, some are ten-minute videos, and they have um, just tons of great, awesome content. Uh, I think you're I think you're really going to like it. It's called Brand Made TV. Hmm. The name sounds familiar. Maybe I've seen that before. Well, I'm going to mention my man, Todd Taylor. I talked about him in my weekly vlog. He's a, a a good buddy. We developed a friendship through the internet over the last five years, just going back and forth. When, I, when he, he reached out to me when my TV show just ended and said he really enjoyed it and he, he felt like we were, we were cousins from another mother because he said, I'm a lot like a lot of the guys he grew up with. And, and we hit it off and he, we would trade. he's always giving me music and sending me albums and stuff. And we finally got a chance to meet in person the other day and it really cemented our friendship. It was a really sweet guy and we had a lot to talk about and we came up with a lot of plans to try and come up with some projects. I don't know where it's going to go, but check out Todd's YouTube page. It's the type of YouTube page that he just parks stuff on because he just didn't want anybody to take his name. But I think if he starts getting an audience, he'll start making exclusive content for his YouTube channel. I think, I think it'd be cool. He's, he's like a world-renowned rec recording artist and so he, he didn't really need the idea of having youtube but i think it would be a good outlet for him if he really started to nurture his channel so check him out hmm. nice um so i have <laughs> i have kind of three things i said earlier i didn't have anything again but i kind of <laughs> have three things so the first one i was gonna just show you um and i'll show you guys and then everybody else can look it up and not find it because it's hard to find um this magazine i got at my grandparents house you see this oh, oh look at that 
Yeah, yes. it's a it's from like 1954, I believe, and it's True, a man's magazine, and it's a work uh, workshop projects I'll take issue. It. Nope, you cannot have it. <laughs> um, there are tons of things in here that are really awesome, and I'm going to actually make some of them and call this book out. But this is a magazine, number one, episode, or issue number one. And I think it's from 1954. I think. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But let me read you some of the things. And these are like, there are plans and full descriptions of how to do this stuff in this magazine. Okay? How to make a sewing center. How to convert your garage. I'm skipping around here. Two gun racks. A gun cabinet. Portable ice box. How to make a $350 station wagon. How to remodel your bathroom. <laughs> how to make a house trailer. A dual purpose trailer. A tennis racket. A gun stock camera. Bird carving. And it just goes on and on. There's crazy stuff. How to make a plywood boat. How to make a cigarette box. A barbecue cart. How to make your entire workshop. <laughs> it's just like... <laughs> Bob, can I make a huge suggestion? Huge amount of stuff. I mean, just like crazy oh, drawings for like how to make all based sorts on the of look stuff. of that book. You know, it would be funny if you did a, a YouTube channel, like a third YouTube channel of you making all those projects, but you have to wear like a plaid short sleeve shirt and like thick frame glasses and short short <laughs> hair protector. Yeah, and like yeah. and make and film everything like in real film, and yeah. have like a really the, proper voiceover man talk about it, like with like a weird deep voice. So it's like uh, a, super slick hair and like a short tie. So it looks like a nineteen sixties vocational video that would be awesome yeah that would be <laughs> I there's love like there's like four stuff, color yeah. pictures in here the rest is black and white anyway but the, i was going to show you this Gunrack, and mention it and then i decided well I, if i'm going to recommend it i should look on uh ebay to see if i can find it looked on ebay couldn't really find that one there's a whole bunch of other issues of this magazine so i just searched google and here's what i searched true man's magazine workshop so i searched that there's a bunch of magazine covers and then the very bottom corner there's a picture of Jimmy's book. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> what did you search? I searched True True Man's Magazine Workshop. And Jimmy's Workshop Mastery with Jimmy Duresta oh is right goodness. down there. In the bottom. Does that mean I'm a real man? I've you arrived. Are a real I'm finally man. a real man on Amazon. On that same row, I would like to point out though that uh, Utah Bride and Groom has an has a picture on that <laughs> same row. So yeah, you man, know. It could be a man. <laughs> Anyway, yeah. so that's a cool magazine if you can ever find. And there's a True Magazine, which is not workshop stuff, but I guess that's just like a workshop hmm. special edition, whatever. So I can't speak for the rest of it. But um, so that's one. The other thing is a cartoon uh, for my that my kids started watching. And I know most of you won't care about this, and that's fine. But if you have kids, if you've never seen Gravity Falls, hilarious. Hmm. We just started watching it. It's really funny. It's like, it's one that, I think grown-ups who like cartoons would also enjoy. It's a lot of really funny stuff. Um, so we started watching that. It's on Hulu or something. And then, got to say a special shout-out to our buddy Kyle Toth. Yes. Kyle hit 100,000 subscribers, like, last week or something. And he put out one of the funniest 100,000 videos I've ever seen. And I'm not even going to tell you about it. You just need to go watch it. There's, there's like, uh, a dance party involved. And then uh, Trustin Timber was with him, helped shoot him, and he did a behind-the-scenes that's pretty interesting as well. So go check those out. Can I add something to your, your old magazine there? Um, um, sure. <laughs> you like, can't add it to the magazine. But yeah. <laughs> um, if you uh, – I don't know if any if you people know this, but uh, a lot of the old um, popular mechanics – uh, magazines, they're all archived on, on Google, and you can actually flip through page by page. And mm -hmm. every uh, um, every edition has like a woodworking project in there. So uh, just search for like Popular Mechanics June 1957, and you should come up with the link, and then you can actually flip through the magazine. If we if I can find the link, I'll, I'll throw a link huh. in, the, in the stuffs. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. I'd like to go through and check those out. Cool. Well, um, I want to thank our Patreon supporters before we go. And we have a new person for me to call out, which is really awesome. Make, Build, Modify, Wise Old Dowell, and Jedediah Schultz, the Irish craftsman. Oh. They're our top supporters over there. He's been a big supporter so. of mine as well, so thank you, brother. He's always sending me really awesome. nice notes. Sweet. That's really cool. Yeah, thank you to everybody who supports us on Patreon. Uh, it, it's, it's really great to have that, and we are grateful. So... Um, and also, I don't, I don't know that we've said this lately. Actually, I know we haven't said this. So I was on a plane recently, 
and I didn't have anything to do, and I was like, somehow ended up on iTunes looking at reviews for podcasts. And I was like, oh, I haven't looked at the reviews on our podcast in a long time. So I went and looked at it with a little bit of apprehension. <laughs> but you know what? <laughs> we had, did you know that our, our we're rated five stars? No way. We are rated five stars, and like there's two four star or two two star reviews and one one star, I think, and the rest are like fours and fives. Those are three people that hate me because I'm a snobby a hole. As, as but, I say, <laughs> we got five stars even with me on the podcast. <laughs> they're for me, I'm sure. I'm sure they're for me. But I want to point it out though because that's awesome. That I mean, the good. fact that you guys who listen go there and leave. Even any kind of review is pretty awesome, but positive, like five star reviews. I thought you were going to say, you guys. the fact that Jimmy's on our podcast and we still got that. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, early I on, I went to look at the anyway. reviews and there was some guy that's like, Jimmy thinks who the hell he is. And I never read another review again. So that's the, that's my impression of our reviews is what, from two and a half years ago. Some guy said that I was a, a snobby, yeah. snobby person that begins well, with Well, you know, I mean, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Yeah. And anyway, I just want to point that out and say thank you to everybody because that's super cool. And it yeah. was, I had that idea going into it too. I was like, okay, buckle up. I'm going to go in and read the comments <laughs> and then, you know, expecting up. like that. These guys are idiots. <laughs> things, but it was really encouraging. You know, that nice. being so said, thank, thank more you. now than ever, and uh, you know, we could say thank you a hundred times, and I mean it every time. Now more than ever, I'm getting more people that I bumped into, and in every email that I get, where people say positive things, they always say, "Love the podcast." And a lot of times mm-hmm. those emails are because of the podcast and saying, I heard you say this on the podcast and I just wanted to reach out and, you know, confirm or talk to you more about it. So it it's nice that people are listening. So thank you all very much. Yeah, for sure. Oh, I forgot one more thing. This is going really long. But um, the the uh, panel that I did at Maker Fair with Mark Rober and Laura Kampf and Peter Brown, I put the video up this week, last week, I think. And it's on my second channel, and I think it's a really good discussion. You know, it's all of us not talking, not just me, so I can say that confidently <laughs> that it's good. Um, yeah, and it's there, so if anybody didn't get to go to Make a Fair and they want to see that, it'll be there. And then my solo talk will be up sometime soon. I'll try to get it uploaded. But nice. Yeah, okay, that's it, right? That's it. Yep. Cool. That's Thanks it. for listening, everybody. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye. You guys know what 143 means, right? Mm, is that your cell number in prison? That's my area code. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell anybody I was in prison. I told you not this guy. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs>